you know, our greatest asset isn't this office, it's the people that are in it. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Joe Morris in their beautiful studios in Hackney, Mare Street. Um, the architect who is spearheading Morris & Company across two studios, one here in London and one in Copenhagen. And it was an absolute delight. So Joe's had an amazing career spanning over 25 years of professional practice um, where he has achieved widespread international recognition. He has increasingly advocated uh, for a sense of urgency for fair and transparent practice, inclusivity and equality through open dialogue and critical debate, whilst encouraging the broader company to take ownership of projects and develop their own careers and interests. Joe has represented the practice on a global platform, lecturing on the work of the studio in many leading UK universities, as well as in Barcelona, Bilbao, Buenos Aires, Copenhagen, Hamburg, Liege and Romania. He has taught at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, the Universidad de Navarra in Pamelona, and La Salle School of Architecture in Barcelona, and he has been a visiting examiner at Plymouth and Oxford Brookes Universities. Joe is a founding participator in London On, a global self-initiated research program exploring a worldview on cities across Europe, and has also contributed to a number of local authority design review panels, including Lewisham, Brent, Hackney, and currently Southwark. In today's episode, we will be discussing Morris and Company and their movement towards becoming a B Corporation. We discuss about practice ethos and values and being able to find harmony with the, business, with the business agendas of their clients. And we also talk about creating a new office in a new city in Copenhagen. So loads of fantastic gold nuggets here, a truly fascinating conversation and quite a privilege. So sit back, relax and enjoy Joe Morris. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Yeah, so Fight Club was this idea that you would, um, kind, you know, the whole idea that everyone's talking about carbon, everyone's talking about how do you build buildings, what is the right system to use, and whoever you talk to, they'll all say a completely different thing. So how, is you, how are you as an architect or um, as an engineer or as a client or as a planner supposed to make sense of it all? Because someone will say it's the opposite. Black is white. Someone will say it, mm. like politics. And so um, I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to struggle on this anymore. I'm going to get the people that think they know what they're doing to do it, and we're going to get them to do it in front of a live audience. And the live audience can then grill them. Let's call it Fight Club. So um, in the, we have this sort of vegan restaurant down in Hackney and Hackney Road. And the idea being we put them in the kitchen. We strip out the kitchen. We strip out all the chefs. We put them in the kitchen in the heat, and we all stand around. It's like literally everyone's standing up cheek by jowl, face to face, with a, with a phone on a little gimbal, which was broadcast live on Instagram, and we get each person with no tech, no props, literally, with a microphone, so right, how are you saving the world, Mr. Planner? And then they do 10 minutes of spiel, and you can work out when they're presenting, so haha, that's just prep, that's just, you're, that's just verbiage, like, like that's a just a mantle, battle, basically. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, it's a rap <laughs> battle, or, or a kind of, you know, bebop, whatever. It's like, um, and um, yeah, it's been really good, and we've done, we've done four, we did, um, we started with the engineers, and then you've got engineers saying it's got to be made of stone, it's got to be made of timber, or you know, engineering in concrete is the best thing because it has so many other properties. You don't, you know, exactly straight off the bat, everyone's saying something different. So mm. there isn't a kind of general consensus that you do it a particular way. And then we had uh, clients do it, which was really good. So we had general projects in there, be first, um, various others, and that was br really interesting just to watch how they came at it. A couple of them were in, were pitch, were pitching our thing, not answering the question, classically, and others like really, really on it. Uh, we had a planning 
system, and then we're going to do architects, and we're going to do so forth. So, but it's evolved into this really amazing thing. So we're going to have a number, of, a couple of goes of it next door at some point as well in the, in the come. So really, 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 so fun. Such energy, you know, loads of energy in the room for it as well. Love it. Yeah. Well, I think that's such a, a really nice segue into the conversation yeah. today. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had a, some interesting <coughs> conversations um, previously, and just now over coffee about. Um, the legacy of, of a business, if you like, yep. um, and the importance of running a value-driven company. It's very yep. clear from the work that you guys have been doing, the projects that you've been involved in, yep. um, this building that we're in now, which yep. is absolutely extraordinary, um, you know, yep. really beautiful restaurant, coffee shop, yep. you know, you've got this amazing kind of open frontage to the public. Yep. And it's, you know, this is a business which is very clearly manifesting a clear set of values and the work that you're doing, when we look at the, the, the projects in your portfolio, yeah. there's a very clear civic sense of responsibility yeah. that, the, that the work is doing. Mm. Um, and obviously I know a little bit about you, and you're, I know you're a, a, an advocate for veganism yep. and for cycling and yep. for... Hence the know, look and the broken arm. Exactly, <laughs> you're literally, yeah, I'm literally wearing, you're wearing the rings. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how, how, do you, how do you balance having values and doing social work in an ever-increasing difficult landscape of procurement yeah. and commercialism yeah. and just aggressive business how does how does yeah. it i mean i think i think the first thing is kind of i guess it's quite interesting to hear you say all that because um you know we we often wonder what we look like on the outside and for you to say that you think that we are you know a practice which looks like we're value driven is really interesting you know because um i genuinely worry that we might not look like that mm -hmm. as well um, so that's good and you know some somehow we're doing something good that you know that would be a thing that people might might um, spot and actually we're just in the middle of um, trying to um, uh, take on a kind of head of communications because of that point I, I worry that the message isn't getting across enough because genuinely we're kind of it's baked in in everything that we do here mm -hmm. um, and, it, and but it does create problems it genuinely does create problems there is continuous conflict, um, ethical and philosophical conflict between a kind of value-driven business and actually paying the bills, really. Yeah. It, is that, it is that simple. And I guess you know, there's nothing new here. I'm sure that many other practices will say exactly the same thing. So, so obviously we went on a journey. Um, you mentioned it before, but we were sort of Doug and Morris Architects before that with Joe Morris Architects, 15 years worth of stuff. And you, we were definitely working in a way which was... Um, kind of celebrating building as object, material form, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of process driven, um, form making, elegance and all those sorts of things. And, you know, 15 years worth of doing that, you start to work in a very particular way. So the types of projects that you have and the kind of the reasoning and the form making, the material, the junction, the kind of philosophy of materials is sort of embedded in the business. And then when we relaunched, we were very much trying to, and we called, when we relaunched, we called it a sort of change of state. And, the, and it was on our website. The plus on our website is a sort of no, an idea that it's no longer sort of two people, but a kind of a collective. So Morris mm -hmm. being, you know, we, we stuck with the Morris, we put the plus in it, it's the plus company. So it's this company bit, which is the important bit and bring those values to, 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 to what we're doing. Um, and so we've been gradually sort of trying to surface a kind of real sense of urgency that the practice has, that people have, you know, mm -hmm. me going vegan, um, people like Miranda, who's running a um, uh, sort of housing um, sort of department, I suppose, or kind of area specialism. She is driving and an, an advocate for dealing with, you know, social injustices, um, uh, you know, homelessness, hidden homelessness, you know, impoverished kind of housing. So she is championing all of that. I'm trying to sort of change the way that we think about the office as well. So, again, we're working in the office sector quite a lot. And, you know, in some ways, speculative office is a sort of corporate capitalist, big floor plate, big beams, lots of materials. Max world. it out. Max it out, you optimise mean, it. Yeah. And I'm trying to do, I'm saying, look, if you want that, we can do that. But, you know, people need more, people want more. And I think I can do both. I can sort, and which is kind of your question, I can give you social change and you know human value, mm -hmm. building in the intrinsic necessities that you know the new world needs, and still deliver your efficient kind of floor plate sort of thing. Yeah. And it might mean that we have to sort of change a little perception on a grid, a floor build-up, a material use, or so forth. But they're infinitesimal changes in the mm -hmm. bigger picture. 
what we can bring to you if we get the kind of the, the metrics right is way more. So we've been calling it a thing called Office Plus. So it's about you know building in these other kind of opportunities. And that, again, they're not like complicated things. Open a window, a bit of balcony, some biophilia, the ground floor flows like we've got here. It's not kind of you walk in and it's security and a desk. But it's stuff, yeah, you know, and I think that's what, and we want it to be like, you know, more of the city, but all of that is definitely an uphill struggle. So we've definitely got projects which are coming in, and you think, God, you know, if only it was not quite this, but over here, and you've got mm. to try and, I guess, we see everything as an opportunity. So it's like, how do we push a client gently? and just get them and show them away. Um, and a client that sort of in some ways comes uninformed or mm -hmm. slightly green is a good one because you can sort of say, look, there are ways of doing this. We can still give, you know, viability is important, costs are important, risk is important, program and all that sort of stuff. And we can do all these other things as well. And these other things will greatly enhance your portfolio, yeah. your, your, your return on your investment, will make sure you make a profit. But profit's more than money. Profit is a city-based human experience sort of thing and that's what we should be thinking about how, how do you kind of qualify working with the right clients then because again in, if you're working in these kind of industries sectors yeah. with office development that is notoriously particularly here in london yeah. it's aggressive it's yeah. going to be fast paced it's yeah. going to be results orientated and you're making a stand for creating bits of city yeah. and notoriously we always have this kind of conflict between you know Architects are often very good at considering all of the stakeholders involved in a building, not just the one who's paying the bills. Yep. But yep. also, on the same token, we can often not listen to the stakeholders, what they actually want. And yep. again, they're the ones who are controlling the purses. Yep. And how, how do you kind of, how do you align your kind of more holistic values and contributions to the city with the kind of cut and dry business agenda of a, of a developer, yeah, for yeah. example. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, in some ways, is what I sort of said before, it's kind of, like Office Plus, I've got, let's talk about that. So Office Plus is an idea that we can deliver your 85% net to gross. We can squeeze the hell out of a core and it'd be the most efficient core. We can work with your engineers and drive the most material efficient, low carbon output that you possibly want. We can optimize your grid. We can get the kind of distance from grid to column, to wall, to window, nail it for you. It's dead easy, that's easy stuff. The bit that if we can get it right and we really optimize it and you've got a bottom line purse, which is X amount of money. If we can do all, we can do all of that and say, and actually have a little bit of purse left, yeah. then we can bolt on a couple of other things. And it's, it's, that's the skill set, I think. If you're, right. if you're working in a sort of capitalist, profit-driven, uh, money-oriented sector, generally speaking, most, of, most speculative development is that. You know, I was thinking about it the other day, segueing a little bit, but this idea that um, there's no, if you're, not, if you're working in the private sector, and in whatever typology you're working in, mm -hmm. it's the, the, the only way that the, pro the project works is that someone gets money in the bank. It's a profit-driven exercise. So yeah. this idea that there's social change, there's social value, it's all of, you're only doing that, genuinely, I think, I'd, say, I'd love to see anyone say us otherwise, you're only doing it because you know that you need to do this in order to generate profit. And profit is a way you invest back in yourself, <clears throat> do more of it, and your bank balance grows. It's a sort of simple exercise. Yeah. If you work for, I guess, local authorities, you're looking, you know, for sort of, you know, uh, uh, not for profits and, 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 and charities, it's a different thing. So when you're working in the private sector, and we've got a lot of that, you're generally working against that kind of, you know, bottom line dollar or pound in a bank. Yeah. And, and that's really hard. And, and I guess you've got to find the sort of clients who sort of will basically face up to it and accept that that's a thing, mm -hmm. whilst at the same time knowing that, you know, there is a calling and they do want to sort of, you know, make some, um, some, some changes. And we, we like to sort of, if they're not with us at the beginning, then hopefully during the course of the, the, the program, they come out and they've learned something. And, and again, not in a patronizing way at all, but I say, if we're, if we're a, you know, a sort of social driven um, uh, practice and a, a, an organization generally isn't as much, yeah. you've just got to try and change it and change as much as you can. Um, how, do, how do you go about finding those kinds of relationships to begin with? What's your kind of business development strategies that you use? Yeah, gosh, I mean, strategies. Um, <laughs> um, I guess 
I guess, I, you know, we've quite a big practice now. So, you know, we've grown to 70-ish. Mm. We've got a studio in Copenhagen um, and with seven or eight people and 60-odd here. Um, so, you know, we have a purse to fill as well. And so it's so one of those things where it's like, herein lies the dilemma. You know, social-driven practice, you're investing in people. So every single person that works has their own life, their mm. own life story. By me banging on about plant-based circular, zero waste, blah, 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 hopefully I'm changing people. And I actually learned a couple, uh, that a couple more people in the office today were, were vegan. I don't know whether it's because of me, but vegan in the practice. And that's always enlightening that some other people are doing it and we can share those stories. And so, you know, the, the, the sort of day-to-day -day journey that people go on is profoundly important. Mm -hmm. So we get to connect outside to in and the two things influence each other. You can't sort of save the world um, if you're an architect, if you still go home and eat lamb at the weekend and mm -hmm. sort of drink whatever. You've got, to, you've got to work out how to see that it's all part of the same soup, as it were. Yeah. So we're kind of genuinely trying to get people to kind of acknowledge that and be part of that. So mm -hmm. interconnecting your life, the way you travel to work, what you eat, how you practice, the form making, the typologies, the projects, the disciplines, the build, the waste. Yeah. It's one thing sort of thing and you know we're, we are in a crisis and um, I, I guess I worry I don't think people are taking it seriously enough um, I don't think anyone's really it's difficult to in, in a way to take it seriously enough because mm -hmm. it's su such a profound cr uh, crisis isn't it yeah we can't turn it quick enough the idea that we might be able to um, you know suppress the kind of the, 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 the temperature change to one and a half degrees over the next decade or so is it's already, it's like fantasy, you know, so actually we have to all think about, you know, ad adaptive ideas about, you know, what we do. So, I don't know, it's sort of, um, it, how, do we capture, how do we capture those clients? I, I genuinely don't know what the answer is. I know that getting these people to be in it, for them to be in it with other clients mm -hmm. and to link the whole thing together um, and to make the change and just to keep banging the drum is the only way that I know how to do it. Yeah. So, so very much, I mean, again, it's, it's interesting because you're very um, vocal, if you like, within the industry and, you know, you use your platform or other platforms to be able to make a case and demonstrate thought leadership and be yeah, a leader yeah, in, yeah. In, these sorts of, in, in these sorts of realms. So I imagine that your clients, they know what you're about before they... Yeah, you know they, yeah. they they get involved with you. Do you, do you ever have this kind I wonder, of kind of I'd, really? Yeah, I often wonder whether I kind of worry about it. So it's like no. there's, a, there's a classic thing here. It's like again repeating the same, coming at that question, the first question a bit from another angle. Seventy people to to feed. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Keep your yeah. mouth shut. Get the get it in. Get the bread in. Get people happy. Feed it. Grow the thing. Blah blah blah. Or you say a few things and you start rubbing people up a bit the wrong way and people see you in a different way and, oh, I don't want us to work with those guys. And they, so it's like, what's the right answer? Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know. I'm kind of, you know, it's a lot of what I do is from the heart, you know, I wear it on my sleeve. Um, I've got some incredible people here that, so it's not, you know, this isn't the Joe Morris show at all. Um, you know, we've got some incredible people here that are just way more intelligent than I am, who know how to build better than I do, who know how to turn a computer on and use it, which I don't anymore sort of thing. I'm like a dinosaur in this thing. But as, I, guess I'm, I guess what I'm doing is kind of creating a, an environment for people to sort of step forward and for the business to have, as we call it, a kind of um, a, a number of voices. Mm -hmm. But the voices are all effectively coming from a centre, a kind of ethical position, which is we want to not just do it lazy. We want to be, we want to have integrity, authenticity. We want to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's a science-based, maths-based, problem-solving thing to create human experience yeah. on whatever we do sort of thing. And everybody, I think, I hope, gets it. How, how has the business changed? I mean, as you're saying, you're now 70 people. Yeah. Um, how has the business changed in terms of operations and structures, yeah. say, from the early days of founding this group? Yeah. And also... How, how philosophically have you changed since your practice with Mary? Oh yeah, so, um, so we, go, we go with Mary and I. So you know, when we started back in 2004, mm -hmm. um, we'd never worked before either. So we were kind of you know, young kids, I think we were 34, 33, 34 between us, you know, come out of university, you're six years out of university, no real idea what we're gonna do. Um, hadn't worked before. So we were both at the Bartlett, right? Both at the Bartlett at different times. Right. Um, 
and then sort of year, I think I was a year ahead, um, just by birth, but mm -hmm. nothing else. Yeah. And then you land, and then you get going, and then you know you realise that we've got these kind of complementary skills, the right sort of projects work together. It's kind of Mary and Joe, and then a bunch of other people sit underneath, and then you know over three or four years, you realise you can grow to twelve people. There's a couple of people you're going to bring them in, but I don't think, if I'm honest, um, I can think of you know Mark Shaw. Uh, Pete Grove and various others who were kind of elevated at that time, who were senior, you know, associate directors, senior associates or level. I don't genuinely believe that we gave them a chance, mm. really, I think. And that's, that's a sort of, it was an intentional thing, but it's definitely a kind of culture that we had, which is yeah. like, you know, we're controlling this thing. And I, I think as over time, um, I think that's kind of where we started to kind of, the, that, that sort of, elastic tension started to stretch a bit too much that mm -hmm. I think we did we generally worked in a different way which grew and, 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 and sort of drifted and I think you know my my and again it's not a right or wrong I, yeah. I've got to really stress this is that this is just personal pre preference rather than me being worse or better sort of thing so I got to a position where I'm thinking I kind of need to give, take the reins, I need to give it to some other people, I need to get them to have a go, I need to show them, I need to experience what they experience, I need to learn from their mistakes rather than me beating them up, mm -hmm. that they don't get what I'm thinking sort of thing, and then perhaps we'll explore and, you know, and, and, and we'll evolve and grow from that. So we did that for a couple of years, and then we rebirthed as Morrison Company, and the name, I didn't, it wasn't my name selection, actually someone else in the practice said, we need to keep the Morris in there. It was Miranda actually who, who, just, who did a really amazing pitch because I had loads of other ideas of, of kind of the name. And she said, no, no, you can't do any of those. That's a terrible idea. It's got to be this plus company. Then we evolved that thing. So it was driven by them. Uh, Keir, David, uh, Miranda, um, Judith, who's now joined the, uh, this amazing uh, uh, sort of our practice sort of director. She holds the whole thing together. Without it, we're nothing, mm -hmm. the, these people. Um, and so from those early doors to where we are now, it's definitely a kind of, and it's beyond us as well. It's like we've gradually implemented, you know, really strong structures in the business. So we've got, as I say, with 60 odd people, people want careers, they want to grow. Yeah. So rather than just being a couple of people yielding a pen and everyone doing what they want, well, that's, that's everyone's a, doing it. That's a very wise insight and reflection to have that you, perhaps, you know, you weren't giving uh, previously leaders a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't often hear architects admit that yeah. and I think that's really like that's, that's a big acknowledgement for you to be able to you know have the wisdom to say that's not actually the way that we want to yeah. be creating opportunities yeah. for, for leaders and this is often why we see so much in the industry you know this kind of glass ceiling that occurs yeah. and then no one talks about it yeah. Yeah. and you know then there's the kind of the fierceness of holding on to control of everything yeah. which has a lot of problems in the business sense yeah. A lot of problems. It yeah. makes it very difficult for you know you end up creating a business which is a bottleneck. Yeah. And all decisions have got to and come. And where are they going to go as well? Yeah. What's going to? How do you keep? How do you retain talent? How do you nurture talent if you just stay as you are? Yeah. Sort of thing. That's a really interesting point actually because um, the other thing is, you know, we can do we can do all of that inside, but mm -hmm. actually there's a kind of industry out there, and um, you'd be surprised just how kind of old school. It all is as well, is that still, you know, we've got projects in the US now. Um, we started working in, in, in Asia, in Taiwan, uh, which, you know, really interesting sort of, you know, the culture difference is so, so extraordinary. Uh, we're working in Munich, got projects in Copenhagen, then across, you know, the UK. And there's still this kind of underlying sort of sense that there's an old school version of we've got to speak to the boss. Mm -hmm. the boss has got to be in the room. And I'm like, you don't need me to make a decision about this. These guys can make the decision. So no, we want you. And if you're not there, you know, you're not giving us, we're not getting our money's worth out of you. And it's such an old school way of thinking, isn't it? Yeah. And so like, how do you change that? How do you genuinely change that? You know, how do you communicate it without looking that it's a weakness to you mm -hmm. sort of thing? And I think that's another challenge that I haven't quite got my head around. And I think they, my team gen do, does definitely feel it. I think you know, particularly in the kind of work uh, sec workplace sector, that there's a kind of there's a kind of again there's a sort of um, I don't want to say it in a kind of unfair way, but it feels like an old old school old boys club sort of mentality. Um, there aren't enough women yeah. in it enough, um, and there's not enough youth <clears throat> and enough diversity within within the kind of sector somehow. 
And it's like, you know, that's not cool. And, and so did you find from the client side as well that there is this, um, they want to be talking to the main, yeah. the main guy. Yes, yeah. that's, that's yeah. Yeah, they don't want to I be mean, talking I'd, to anybody you know, else. I'd, I'd rather, I'd very much, like, so what we, and actually interesting, and you know, to just flip it on its head a little bit, I can think of other organizations where, you know, their structure is very hierarchical in the, in the same way that I'm describing. Mm-hmm. Yet, if they um, if they give if we if they gives us the opportunity whereby the way that we present isn't me, but you know the person that's doing it, they'll come off and say, you know what, it's very rare that we get the director not say a thing in a meeting, and that the the your, the, the, the guy that's the associate or the project architect does all the presentation, and it's that good. It's brilliant what you're doing as a practice. And I think, yes, that's it. That's exactly what I'd like every single meeting to be. Yeah. You don't need me. I almost don't need me to be in the room because they're all prepped. Everybody's really well schooled and know what they're doing and can present this and can answer with absolute kind of assurance and confidence in what they're doing. There's no kind of things missing. If mm-hmm. me not being in the room, there's nothing lost sort of thing. Yeah. And I think that's been, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, I always think, that's just so good. That, that, that's like hairs on end. It's working sort of thing. How, how has your role shifted then over the last decade or so? <laughs> yeah. I do, again, I sort of question, you know, what do I do? <laughs> Quite a lot of the time. Yeah, I used to be, I guess in some ways as well, it goes back to this idea of just re- releasing things. But, you know, I'd get Mary and I perhaps, we were, in, we were on everything. So every bill that was paid, everything that came in, every time that we purchased a piece of software every order of some ring of paper, every pencil, every pen stroke, every line, every report, we did it all. So I think it was like literally a total control, um, and, um, which is fine. Again, you've got to do that. You've got to be on it you know, for four or five years. And I guess now it's sort of, I just watch everyone else do it. Yeah. You know, it's the opposite. And it's like, I'm cool with it. I'm cool with the way that my career has sort of evolved over time to just be a sort of... I don't even want to say a, a conductor because I'm not even doing that mm-hmm. because that also would be sort of patronising that somehow you need me to... <clears throat> but I'm definitely in the background pushing and prodding and being in a room and being absent. You know, sometimes I've got to step right in and I say, right, I'm with you, what's going on? Why is mm-hmm. it happening? Other times I'm really distant. <clears throat> we have lots of meetings, lots of reporting, lots of, you know, catch-ups. You know, the big thing for me is design review. So as you know, in this space out here, we try to now do like, you know, in-person reviews. You know, let's lavish it. Let's kind of... Let's celebrate the project where it's at and let's really kind of get underneath the skin of it. Let's get as many people in as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of often in um, bids and presentations, but again, I kind of, I sometimes only do it because I, maybe I'm just so under pressure that I've got to make sure this one lands sort of thing that I might be in the room. But, you know, I like to be in a room with other people and we genuinely, you know, if we're, if we're bidding or pitching, everyone who's in that meeting is talking. So it's like, it's not held by me. It's like, we're all in together, sort of talking mm-hmm. through the thing. So, um, yeah, spinning more plates um, or help making sure that people that are spinning the plates are spinning the plates, sort of thing. So, well, so it's kind of, you've, you're, <coughs> you've created a lot of space for other leaders to kind yeah. of take those opportunities. Yeah. And also being more of a mentor and being someone who's kind of uh, the steward of the company yeah. culture, yeah. as opposed to like, kind of hands-on and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and controlling. Yeah. I mean, I spend a lot of my time, so for example, you know, the, the restaurant that we've opened next door, and we couldn't, we you know, that we didn't need that, but I'd sort of felt that we really did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I really wanted to, again, this whole idea of like post-COVID, this idea of, you know, liberated, everyone's liberated, they can work from wherever they want. So we went fully cloud-based in terms of our operations. We did that to liberate the workplace, or to liberate people from the workplace. Yeah. Turns out that it doesn't do that, actually. It's, um, it's still beset with all sorts of technical difficulties and actually the experience isn't great, um, but we're getting there. Um, but when it does get there, better than it is now, you could, you know, someone could sit on that bit of pavement and have on a phone and build a Revit model. Yeah. The power's there to do that sort of thing. So it's like, once you're in that world, it's like, well, what's the point of having an office? Why, why, why is anyone gonna come in? And so, you know, my thinking is rather than mandate it, so we don't have any quotas, you sort of, at, at the moment, mm-hmm. I'm just saying, because it might change. <laughs> uh, we don't have any quotas. Let's make this brilliant. Let's make it so compelling that you want to come in because you want to be, you want to experience something and it adds value. So people to people is great. Being in the space with people is great. But also, obviously, you know, people like to be efficient. So if you want to do admin or emails or filing or you want to do some 
pro, you know, um, um, some computer-based work, you can do that anywhere. But if it's anything to do with learning, mentorship, training, exchange, nurturing, real design, let's do it together. Mm -hmm. um, so what we started to do as well with Nextdoor is to now service the team and make sure that you know our normal kind of get togethers which generally is now a lot online yeah so monday morning everyone's just 50 60 faces on a screen uh friday nights half of them in half of them out and our cpd is like you know let's not bother coming because it's boring yeah let's make them brilliant so now monday mornings we will feed you and we'll do it in here we'll stand up and everyone gets the mic uh friday nights we do the same and then our wednesday uh, CPD, we basically have a banquet, we feed you, we sit down, it's food, and just let's go slow. And we'll have a couple of hours to slow the whole thing down. Even if you're gonna miss a meeting, you've got to push back an hour. Mm -hmm. Let's do it together. Let's and it's it's amazing just to see fifty people eating, you know, bean stew. Well, I think I think this is really interesting and it's an interesting way of kind of you know, rather than mandating and making everyone yeah. come into the office and yeah. there is obvious benefits for benefits of um, remote working and yep. for certain people it does work very well my concern is often with particularly younger members of the team yep. who perhaps haven't got the skill sets or the experience to work autonomously yep. ne then they're yep. missing you out be in. they're missing out on not yep. being in the office because yep. there's so much stuff that you learn you just pick up on you hear a conversation yep. going on over there you start asking questions yeah. and all of a sudden I mean you, we know that I mean I know I mean, I'm sure you do as well you know, you know, I, you know I'm 50 odd years of age now and I've done I've been doing it for 30 years yeah and I go and come back from, you know, old, pretty old school now. I still think I'm young, but, you know, clearly I'm just falling to pieces. <laughs> but um, being in the room with everyone all the time was a drain, but the amount you learned and what you saw in the kind of, it's just all this kind of body language, the kind of, the way that people communicated, what was going on. You're in the space, you see it all. When you're solo, isolated, unless someone's updating you, you haven't got a clue what's going on. Yeah. You're nothing, you know, so when did that happen? Oh, well, yeah, we've built that two years ago. I didn't know that happened. No, because you were never here. Yeah. Sort of thing. So that's the thing. So just, yeah, just encouraging people to find that balance. And, and, and I like the way that, yeah, kind of having the space here is somewhere which is creating that sense of belonging and tribe yeah. and family yeah. and community, yeah. which is, you, you know, you're missing out if you're not going to be yeah. here. And it's not just the yeah. kind of, you know, it's not a stale corporate environment yeah. where it was just... Yeah. Well, the big thing about this window that we're sitting in now, so, you know, the cameras can't see it, but we've got people walking backwards and forwards, we've got, you know, people drinking stuff out of paper bags, we've got buses backwards and forwards, we've got dust carts, cyclists and so forth, and we're in a room, we've got beyond the box, the people's pavilion mm -hmm. uh, in the space as well, with all these kind of amazing models, so we've got a new me having a kind of, you know, face to face, and this is also the way we just had a resourcing meeting, we've got finance meetings, so... It's like, it's all in one space. It's all yeah. in one kind of field of view. I think that's amazing. And we like, you know, just being here, people seeing us, the whole interaction, the eyes in the room, it's like such, it feels so rewarding and so real and so kind of immediate and so connected that, you know, again, it sort of exemplifies why we've done this project here, mm -hmm. why we've moved into this, that rather than being on a first or second floor in a backwater, let's put it on high street, let's open up the curtains, Let's show everyone what we're doing. Let's maybe not worry too much about the you know, non-disclosure kind of agreements and let's put the model in the thing and just pretend we didn't do it sort of thing. <laughs> and people can see it. It's like you've got kids backwards and forwards, you've got people taking photographs. So that whole connection, it's, it's real. It's really real. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, it's such a big thing. Um, and um, I think, that's, and again, I think it's a, it's a really important experience for people in this office. It's, it's a different, it feels different. It looks different. It smells different. Mm -hmm. And again, hopefully... Coming back to some of the early questions, I kind of hope that even if you've only been here for two years and then you move on, you take some of that with you. You sort of, well, we used to do it like this. In, in, in Morrison Company, we had this other thing. So, you know, you can open a window and you don't have to be so secretive and so kind of, you know, protective and your back turn, you know, turn and face the crowd sort of thing. Yeah. How did this building come about? What was the story behind? Is it something that you guys own or you... No, we definitely don't. You know, we have, we, you know, we haven't got any money. So, um, <laughs> we... Um, yeah, about three years ago, we, I thought it would be a really good idea, we thought it would be a good idea for me to, sort, or us, I say me, I, I did it, but it, through a collective voice, write a vision. And so the vision was, this is what the last three or four years of, you know, being Morrison Company has been about, and if we, do we all agree that this is what we're saying that the future looks like? And it was kind of, you know, growth, numbers, uh, sectors... Um, what else, um, where we would work, the structure of the, of the business, 
um, B Corp, mm-hmm. you know, the transition to a kind of more of a sort of, you know, a, a, a build, a, 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 an office that kind of reinvests the profit back within people is really, really critical. And a big part of this vision statement, which is like, you know, 200 page document, which we've only read once, um, is where should we, where should our home be? So, you know, I coin, I coin it in a massively cliched, and I don't care, I've called it the home of ideas, which is a sort of space which is like, literally, it's like the idea store, David Ajay's thing in Whitechapel. Yeah. Let's put a thing on the high street, and let's show, and let's somehow demystify what architecture is about. Let's mm-hmm. kind of try and remove the cynicism, the kind of the association that people have with architecture and developers. Hey, we're just a bunch of people, and here's some models we made, and here's some people having a meeting, and we just look like normal people. We're not all dressed in black, or maybe I am just today, but you know, we're just like, it's just normal. It's just like people doing yeah. work and trying to make a change. So that was what we wanted. And then, you know, I lived just down the road in, in Tower Hamlets, um, next to, you know, not far from where we are now, I suppose. I love this neck of the woods, you know, backwards and forwards. And I just happened to be looking and I thought, oh, there's a big building that could fit purpose and came and had a look at it and by the time we got here someone had painted the front of it black um, so I'm thinking you know maybe maybe it's got something maybe we've lost something maybe I can bring something super cheap um, so the rent is kind of really low mm-hmm. and you know we have to borrow a lot of money uh, so the business is, has got a fair amount of debt yeah. in order to pay for this but you know the rent and the debt together is pretty much the same per square foot as if we'd stayed where we were, yeah. which had none of it. So, you know, we've got five years worth to pay off, but we won't really notice it. Mm-hmm. We get way more bang for a buck. We get sort of three, two or three times more space. And we get to do, fill it full of life and fun and energy. So, so, you, were, so you were kind of the curator as well of like the, the, the restaurants and yeah. the coffee shop and the other aspects of it. And, yeah, I mean, all and- in collaboration. So again, it's sort of, Start with a vision, and again, you know, like Luke Matone, who who did all the kind of architecture. David Storing, who's been really kind of fundamental. Amelia has been sort of helping in terms of thinking about the whole circular story. Ellie, my wife, who runs Edit next door, we've been working side by side with, right. with them. Egg, who were the contractors here, you had to be really like with them, and they were difficult and easy at the same time. Dimitri, who um, was our kind of, you know, Moldovan carpenter who basically built next door. You know, there's this bunch of people that have made this sort of thing. And I guess all I did was like catalyze it mm-hmm. say, let's do this thing. And before you know it, eight months later, that, something's happened. Did, did it lead, after the kind of success of this project, has it led you to think, well, what if we were the developers? What if we were mm. our own clients? Has that been on the I mean, cards? we've always thought we should do that. Mm-hmm. I guess I don't quite know how to do it. I don't know. I'm not kind of connected enough, I suppose, um, and have the, you know, access to the right partners. Um, and I, if you have any ideas, and let me know. But it's like I really, I've, I've got so much on my plate yeah. with all of this that um, I still feel like you know, Morrison Company is only five years old. Mm-hmm. Actually, interestingly, just before I go back into that, it kind of dawned on me this this last year or so that um, twenty years of practice, fifteen of it was. Doug and Morris, and five of it is Morrison Companies. We've got a five, 15, and 20 year anniversary all at the same time. And I was thinking, that's kind of interesting. That's something we could, we could potentially um, uh, talk about. Yeah. And uh, you know, maybe when we get to that, you know, 20, year 21, six and 16, or whatever it is, maybe start to develop. Yeah. Um, you if may- you lend me some money. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you mentioned earlier as well, a vision document, yeah, two hundred page vision document. Yeah. Now this yeah. this is this is fantastic. Yeah. I never hear yeah. the only other company I know that has one like this is um, Rogers, right? Rogers Slack Carbon Partners, the constitution yeah. that they had in yeah. their office, which was nice. This three hundred page yeah. document that yeah. all the partners poured over, yeah. and and it made an enormous difference to the whole yeah. way of the company's being, if yeah. you like, and the company yeah. being owned by a charity. And yeah. da, da, da. how did this vision document come about? Yeah, so it was, um, I guess. Again, being really honest with you, um, we were in a, so it was, again, I'm going to repeat the names just so, you know, you're clear that it's not me. So Miranda, Keir, Dave and I, um, we were talking about where is the business going to go? What's the website going to say? What kind of work do we want to do? And I kind of, and you know, what's the ownership structure going to look like? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, and we all agree that, you know, to do any of that, we've got to make sure that we're all aligned in the vision sort of thing. So I said, look, I'll write something, but what I'm going to write is what I understand 
It's like a sort of backdrop. It's like in here, it's five years worth of unwritten minutes. And I'm going to just basically try and remember what we said and put it down on paper and play it back to you. And interestingly, you know, once I did it, did it, over, it took me about four months to write it over Christmas during lockdown. Put this on the table. They all read it said, yeah, there's nothing in there we didn't expect. And it's like, perfect. We're all online. We're all, we're all, in, we're all in the same position that we knew where we, we've come from mm -hmm. and we know where we're going. And therefore we're all synergized or whatever the word is, you know, synchronized yeah. to move this thing forward. Um, but interestingly, it's one of those where how life moves so quickly. It's the same for our website, you know, the messaging on the website and, you know, stuff that we do, projects that we're finishing. They already feel really old, like already outdated. It's like we're already leaps ahead in terms of where we're going. So writing a vision document is sort of, it's just a point in time. It almost doesn't serve a purpose beyond just capturing a moment and saying, we're all there, aren't we? But right, let's carry on, let's get on with it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, you know, I think we're in a place now where we, we probably want to start thinking about, you know, doing another one and, you know, someone else writing that sort of thing and just see if we're still in the same place and, you know, where, where are we taking it? How, how, do you keep, how do you keep it alive? Chat, dialogue, debate, arguments, fallouts, projects coming in, meet every now and again, pint of wine. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like just keeping the thing live and active, I think. It's like um, not tending too much to it, not, yeah. not giving it too much gravitas. I think not you not seeing it as a sort of I don't, like you talked bottleneck you know not to sort of not to prevent anything mm -hmm. but in some ways again it's like a cathartic moment to say we're all there yeah we got that that's what we're doing so yeah growth was a big thing S size of the team was a big thing we're definitely going to commit to Copenhagen we're definitely going to move the office we're definitely going to start to bring more specialisms in house so we've got you know in house finance experts. We've got, let's say, Judith, who's running the whole thing. She, she was part of, like, the visioning. Um, we've got um, in-house, you know, digital design, head of digital design, uh, and so on and so forth. We've got, you know, document controllers, head of comms. We didn't have any of that. All of that was part of the vision. So mm -hmm. we're like, well, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Now it's like, so is it working? Is it making any difference? You know, is, are, we, are we on our way? Uh, and I think that could be the kind of, you know, almost do a kind of post-occupancy Review. Evaluation yeah. of the vision statement, in some way. <laughs> um, so, tell us about the the Copenhagen studio and how yeah. that's developed and how does that operate? Yeah, in yeah. Conjunction Again, here. sort of fluid, unstructured, um, no strategy is how it started. Um, again, it comes down to one or two people. A guy called Ed Blake uh, and Therese. Uh, so Ed's from the UK. He met this fabulous lady fell in love, she just happened to be from Copenhagen. I think she was working at, I think she was working at Coffee Architects at the time. She said, I'm going back to Copenhagen. He's like, I've got to come with you. Joe, I'm leaving. It's like, oh my God, you're leaving. He's, you know, he's been with one of the longest standing members of, and he's brilliant. This guy's yeah. so good. He's so quiet and so brilliant. He handed a note to him, it's like three months worth of notice. And then, you know, a couple of weeks before, I said, you know, what are you doing when you go to Copenhagen? He said, I'm really terrified. I don't really have a plan. Let's have a plan let's keep paying you. And you go over to Copenhagen and we've got computers and the internet, let's carry on as if you were here sort of thing. So that became a thing. And then Teresa said, well, she, who is from Copenhagen? She said, well, can I go as well? She's off. And before you know it, two people are there and then a couple of others evolve. And before you know it, we're just throwing money into a sort of Danish pit, <laughs> trying to get them going for three years and nothing yeah. really happening. And, you know, intercompany, but Teresa and Ed are some of the most gifted people I've ever met. So mm -hmm. it's worth it. And then a couple of other people join, and then we won a competition, which was, um, we did a joint uh, venture with a company called KWR. They're based in Berlin, um, and um, we were invited by um, a, a client to basically pitch for a project in Munich, um, just outside the city centre, which was um, three or four hundred unit hotel, big chunk of office on top of that. Right. And underneath it was sort of, you know, leisure stuff and retail. And, and it had been sitting in our spam or junk mail for like a month and a half before we spotted it. Mm -hmm. And we saw David Chipperfield was in there and all these amazing kind of internationals. And we were one of 12. And we're like, don't believe you. Don't believe we've been invited to this. So we phoned them up. They said, yes, you, yeah, 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 you have been invited. <laughs> He's like, oh, you know, excuse my language, but, you know, we should, we better get on with this. So, um, but, you know, we don't know anything about Munich. So it just so happened that one of our previous staff members, uh, Rebecca, had moved to Berlin and worked for KWR. So, mm -hmm. hey, Rebecca, do you fancy? Like, yeah, we'll do this. So we did this to get, and we won it. 
we won this competition. It's like, you know, the first international competition we'd gone for, yeah. the first time we'd sort of collaborated with another practice, all through people that had flowed through us in some ways and gone and done their own thing. And we sort of pulled them back together and we had this amazing... So it's all these different ideas and kind of, you know, maturities were coming to, to, to play. And then, yeah, we built the rest of the Munich... Sorry, the rest of the Copenhagen team around Munich. Wow. And then a couple of other people have joined and we're now working with a company called Real Dania. Right. And we're doing a research project uh, which is basically trying to see if we can push the technical ability of clay products, bricks, um, to achieve the lowest carbon uh, footprint possible. Right. Sort of you know, we're not being paid very much, as it were, so you can't really build a business around it. But the opportunity for doing that is really, really profound. So that's what Copenhagen, and it's only seven people sort yeah. of doing their thing. But it's also a kind of lens, I guess, you know, two cultures, two cities, two slightly different time frames, two outputs. Well, I can imagine you know, as well that um, Denmark, Copenhagen particularly, is a city that's really at the forefront of a lot of the yeah, kind of planning yeah. issues yeah. and, and yeah. master planning and yeah. kind of architecture. Yeah. That and they've got, you know, as a... As a, as a industry out you know they've got such a pool of talent it's a bit like you know what we were saying earlier about you know london yeah copenhagen is like it's equal i think there's some incredible and gifted uh, practices out there and we were working at the moment with a company called kobe right cobe um dan who who runs it and his team and we've been doing joint venture with them so we actually we ended up winning a competition through them for a british client in london so if we weren't in copenhagen yeah we wouldn't have met kobe Kirby wouldn't have invited us for the competition that Stan had been invited for them, who were one of our clients, to bid on the Royal Street, which we ended up winning, sort of thing. It's like serendipitous qualities about, you know, different time zones is kind of what made it special. It's, it's an amazing story, actually. I was expecting something... I, I love these kind of stories where it's a, you kind of see an opportunity, if you like, or you're, you're doing it around a person. Yeah. And then there's value yeah. that that person has, and it's like, sod it, I don't want you to leave. We're going to build, a, we're going to build an office around yeah, you to keep you, keep you in the yeah. team. Yeah. Which must make that person as well, their loyalty and yeah. kind of... Yeah. You know, well, it's, what, it's what, this whole idea that, you know, come, come back to earlier statements that, um, you know, I genuinely perceive that, you know, our greatest asset isn't this office, it's the people that are in it. And again, it all feels super patronising and cliche, but it's just so true yeah. that we're nothing without the skills and the dedication and the sacrifice and the ambition and the vision of every single person that's in here. And, you know, we can't just be the same group of people as well. So, you know, people leave and as much as it kills me, um, it's necessary for people to go and new people come in and people to age and people to move up and more people to come up and yeah. great oaks fall and new saplings grow. It's all that, it's all that sort of stuff. So, you know, and um, I like to be as honest with people as I possibly can to kind of maintain relationships. So bar a couple, I think, I'm being, again, I'm being honest, it's not perfect, but bar a couple, I'm kind of in touch with most people that have come through um, and really close working relationships with them. And actually my previous employers, Paul Monaghan, Simon Alford, Pete and Johnny, you know, they're just like, you know, I'd like to think that they were friends, you know, Paul, you know, specifically is like a really close friend and we, you know, work together. And I guess having that, knowing that people is the, is the strength, is the power. Yeah. And being honest and looking after people because it will always come back. Beautiful. And that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Joe, Fantastic. Thank you Excellent. so much for the Great. conversation. Pleasure. That was good. Good. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Enjoyed it. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.